Hi Year 4, well it's me again, back to read the next bit of The Creakers. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's um, start of chapter 1. So we're going to finish this chapter and then see where it takes us. So yesterday we found out that Lucy's mum had vanished. So let's see what happens next. Lucy's heart sank. This all seemed far too familiar. On the day her father disappeared, one of the strangest things was that his favourite chunky black boots with yellow laces, and, um, which he wore every single day, were still sitting by the front door, like he'd never left, just like her mum's shoes. Lucy knew there was only one thing for it. She was going to have to call the police. She'd never done that before, and her heart was pounding like a drum in her chest as she pressed the number nine three times with a shaky, nervous finger. Now, what do you suppose happened next? If you think a police officer answered the phone and said, It's okay, Lucy, we found your mum and we'll bring her right home. We'll bring her home right away. We'll even pick up some breakfast for you too. What would you like? Well, then you'd be very wrong indeed. And she'll probably never write a book. What actually happened was possibly the worst thing Lucy could think of. Nothing. The phone just rang and rang and rang and rang and carried on ringing until Lucy hung up. Since when do the police not answer the phone? Lucy said to herself, her voice sounding unusually loud in the empty house. A little voice in her head told her the answer. Something spooky is going on. Lucy pulled open the front door and stepped out into the stinking morning air. Oh, it was quite normal for the air to be stinky outside the Dunstan's family house. It smelled like a mixture of bum gas with a hint of mature sock cheese and a sharp absence of freshly brewed cabbage. It wasn't the house that smelled, it was a truck parked in the driveway. It was one of those chunky, clunky, nostril-stinging, rubbish-collecting trucks that trundled around the road and around town with those jolly-looking grubby people in grimy ovals collecting everyone's rotten rubbish bags. Lucy's dad had been one of those jolly-looking, grubby, rubbish-collecting people. He was the bin man for Whiffington Town, where he lived. Sorry where he used to live, before he disappeared. Since he vanished, his truck had just been parked in the driveway, stinking out the whole street. Of course, Mrs Dungston had tried to sell the truck, but no one wanted a stinky old thing like that. Even Whiffington scrap metal, scrap metal said that the pole was too strong for them to crush it. And so there it stayed, on Lucy's driveway. If you ever find yourself behind one of those trucks, take a little sniff, just a little one, and you'll know what Lucy Dungston's house smelled like. Anyway, back to the day it all began. Out in Lucy Street, Cluster Avenue, she noticed instantly that things weren't right. Usually there was a long line of traffic clogging up the road as mums and dads took their kids to school and went to work and drove to the post office and the hairdressers and did all the boring grown-up things as Boring stuff that grown-ups do. But today, the road wasn't busy. It wasn't just not busy. It was completely deserted. Not a single car. Lucy looked left, then looked right, then looked left again, then looked right again. And then she repeated that about 20 more times. Which I won't bother to write because that would just be silly. But when she'd finished, she was convinced that she was right. Something weird was definitely happening in Whittington Town. What the jiggins is going on? She said to herself. What the jiggins indeed, Lucy. Where was Mr Radcliffe, the wrinkly old man who did yoga in his front garden in his underpants? He claimed it was a secret to staying young. Maybe I should try that. Where was Mr Radcliffe? Where was Molly, the milk lady, who delivered fresh bottles of milk from her electric van? And Mario, the Italian man from the next street, who jogged past every morning in his skimpy lycra shorts? Where was everyone? That's when Lucy heard a noise. Her heart leapt. Was her mum? 
a long, slow creak came from somewhere along Clutter Avenue, followed by a sudden clang. Hello, Lucy called. Mum? A small voice asked from behind the garden, two doors down. Oh, Ella, it's just you. Lucy sighed in relief as Ella Noying appeared. First, her bouncy Afro hair peeped out into the street, followed by a round rosy cheek. Round rosy cheeks and her big, deep, dark brown eyes that always managed to get her out of trouble. She was wearing bright pink pyjamas made of shiny silk with her initials embroidered on the pocket. In one hand was a pair of pink heart-shaped designer sunglasses. Lucy never saw Ella anywhere without those. Lucy, I can't find Mama or Papa and my avocado needs mashing, Ella whined. Before Lucy could reply, another door opened across the street. Dad? whispered Norman Quirk, a boy from Lucy's year at school, as he hesitantly stepped into his front garden. Norman was dressed in a pristinely ironed, meticulously clean scout uniform, which were covered in the most achievement badges Lucy had ever seen. Here's a list of some of Norman's badges. A cleatron, a tree climbing badge, a tent pitching badge, a badge for spreading butter on toast all the way to the edges, the indoor challenge badge, the outdoor challenge badge, the shake it all about door challenge badge, a bed making badge, a cake baking badge, the eating the cake that you baked in the bed that you make badge, the remembering to wash your belly button badge. I'm sure these aren't real. And even a badge for collecting lots of badges. And there was a few empty spots on his uniform he needed to fill with a few new badges. Oh, hi. Uh, I mean, morning, civilians. Norman said, nervously holding up his three fingers in scout salute before fiddling with his neatly combed, mousy brown hair. With his other hand, he covered his mouth to hide his train track braces. I haven't seen my dad, have you? Yes, scooping a handful of mud from his front garden and sniffing it as if trying to pick up his dad's scent. When Norman bent down, Lucy caught sight of his transformer socks. Ella giggled at him. Not in a mean way, but just because she found Norman sort of funny. Everyone did. Norman was different. Sometimes people who are different get laughed at, but it's always the different ones who make a difference. Lucy heard her dad's voice say in her head he had his own way of looking at things. On cloudy days, he'd tell Lucy, the sun just needs a holiday so it can shine better tomorrow. When she came second to her friend Georgia in the sack race on sports day, he told her, don't be upset, you've just made your friend so happy. And when she asked him if he liked being a bin man, he said, You'd be surprised what people throw away, Lucy. One man's rubbish is another man's favourite pair of black boots. And he clipped his heels together with a wink. I've not seen your dad. Sorry, said Lucy, shaking off her daydream about her father and elbowing Ella to stop her laughing. My mum's missing too. Suddenly another door opened. Sissy McNabb ran out into the street in tears. Then Toby Cobblesmith, who had his shoes on the wrong feet. Next, William Trumbull... Trundle and Brenda Payne searching for their mum and dad, then another kid and another, until one by one, every child in Whiffington Town came stumbling out of their houses in their pyjamas, dressing gowns and slippers, trying to find their parents, nans and granddads, aunts and uncles. They were all gone too. There wasn't a single grown-up to be seen. There was such a kerfuffle in Clutter Avenue. Some children were crying, others were laughing, and a few were still fast asleep in bed and hadn't noticed anything yet. What's going on? they shouted. Where are our parents? they called. What are we going to do? they yelled. Lucy took a breath and tried to think. Well, what would my mum do? she said to herself. How did my mum find out what was going on in the world? Then, before she knew what she was doing, Lucy found herself clambering onto the steps of her dad's stinking rubbish truck, and above the noise, she yelled, The news! There was silence. Everyone turned to look at Lucy. We have to watch the news. I know it's super boring, but whenever my mum wants to know what's going on in the world, she always watches the news, she told them. 
The children looked at each other uncertain. I'm sure you know that the news is the biggest snore fest on TV, but Lucy did have a point. She's right. Norman whispered to Ella, too frightened to say it out loud. She's right, Ella shouted, not frightened of anyone. To the television, they all cried in unison. And every child on Clutter Avenue in Whiffington Town pushed past Lucy and piled into her house. In a matter of seconds, her living room was full from carpet to ceiling with scared children in their PJs. The children were sitting on the floor. There were children sitting on the children sitting on the floor. You can see them all there look, watching, sitting on top of each other, watching the TV, waiting for the news to start. There were even children sitting on the children, sitting on the children, sitting on the floor. They were all terrified and mainly because their parents were missing, but also a little bit freaked out because they were about to watch the news without being made to. Lucy switched on her TV. Have you got any popcorn? Asked the child sitting on the floor. Uh, sorry, I don't think we do, Lucy replied. Chocolate hobnobs? Asked the child sitting on the floor. No, chocolate hobnobs either. Mum doesn't buy those anymore. Not since. Well, well, never mind. Uh, we just don't have any. Do you mean we have to watch TV without any snacks? And Ella, who was sitting on the child, sitting on the child on the floor. Ah, OK, well, I'll see what we've got, promised Lucy, whizzing off to the kitchen. She returned a few minutes later with all the boxes of cereal from the cupboard and handed them round the room. Take a handful, pass it on, she said, and got back to finding the 24-hour news channel. The moment it flicked on, her heart stopped. Oh no, Lucy cried, look! The crowd of children spat out their cornflakes and Cheerios in shock, showering the room with bits of soggy cereal. What do you think they could see? Hmm. I wonder. Back on the TV, they could see the normal news desk, the normal sheets of paper and the normal coffee mug, but there was something not normal about it. Who do you think was missing? Yeah, I agree. It was the news presenter. He was missing. Ella pushed to the front. Try another channel. Maybe your TV's broken, Lucy. Don't you have a TV repair badge? She demanded, turning to Norman, who tried his best to hide when everyone looked at him. Perhaps I should take a look, he said sheepishly. Sorry, oops, watch out, he muttered as he almost stepped on everyone's fingers. Well, why isn't it working? Ella said bashing the remote on the side of the TV. Um, well, actually, I do have a badge in TV remote control functions, and as the only member of the Whiffington Scout Troop present today, aren't you the only member of the Scout Troop? Full stop, said Ella, and everybody laughed. Norman sat down, looking defeated, on what he thought was the arm of the sofa, but it was actually the head of another child sitting on another child. Here, just do your best. Lucy said, taking the remote from Ella and handing it to Norman. Norman smiled at her for once, forgetting to hide his braces. He flicked through a few channels, hoping to find a grown-up of any kind. Silly Sunrise, the kids' show, had no friends over the clown, getting pied in the face. Wakey, wakey, Whiffington had no Piers Snorgan, although that was probably an improvement. Norman flicked through the sports channels, the shopping channels, all the channels he could, and not a single one of them had a single grown-up. It was almost as if every adult on the planet had just disappeared. Overnight, from Lucy's mum to the news presenter, they had all gone. Okay, so this bit says, okay, this isn't the next chapter, but I just wanted to check that you were all right, because I know this bit of the book is a bit spooky, but trust me, all works out in the end. Well, at least I think it does, maybe. Actually, I can't quite remember what happens. It might get really, it might get really, really scary. Do you think we should keep going? i tell you what, we'll keep reading. Good luck. Chapter two. The goodbye note. Do you know what? Let's finish that next chapter tomorrow.